Welcome back to another Ocean Software video. I'm going through the entire Ocean Software collection I have for the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Now I thought I'd do this for quite a few publishers on the Spectrum, because the Spectrum collection is rather vast, and there's loads of games within it. I thought I'd just highlight some of my favourite publishers, uh, and some of my favourite games to be released on the system. So Ocean Software released a hell of a lot of games, um, and most of them I've got fond memories of, to be fair, even though I didn't play them at the time. When I first got my Spectrum back in 1986, I played a lot of them then. So yeah, so a lot of fond memories of that particular company. Not only that, it's also the 40th year since their founding. So what I'll do is go through the games. I've got nine, I believe, for 1984. Like I said before, not all the games got released. Well, they got released in 84, but some of the dates on the cassettes say 83. But yeah, and some of the adverts that got released for the games came out in 84. So I weren't 100% sure where the games actually reside in the whole grand scheme of things. to go by really is how the games look in terms of their livery. It might say 83. I haven't seen an advert till 84. I'm trying to marry them up really about where they might sit within the set. So a bit of a pain in the ass to be honest. Uh, one game here is probably one of Ocean's biggest franchises. One of the best games I've played from Ocean. In fact probably the best game of its type I've ever played on the Spectrum. Even to this day. And I played quite a few games like that. A couple of sequels to hits from 1983, but many games here are quite unique and for the first time ever, um, I played them for the first time ever making this particular video. So yeah, and most of them, I've got to be honest, I quite enjoy. Now, I'm trying to think, what's his name? Bob Wakely had done the artwork for all of these games, I believe. Um, David Thorpe, I believe, on the loading screens for all these games as well. I'm not sure what other role David Thorpe played within Ocean Software. Did he do graphics for any of the games like Daily Thompson, for example? Um, and Hunchback 2, which have got quite similar graphical styles. Quite large sprites. It, yeah, look, yeah, when you see it, you'll think mm, they look quite similar. You probably won't think that, but I certainly did. So, yeah, the first game I'm going to show you then is. Um, a game called Eskimo Eddie. Who's Eskimo Eddie? I hear you cry. Um, so yeah, it's very similar to say Horace Goose Skiing at the beginning, or Frogger. You've got to go up to the top of the screen to go and rescue the penguin to bring him back down. Whilst avoiding what looked like clouds, but I'm pretty sure probably icebergs. And polar bears. You do that three times, up and down three times, you go on to the next level, which reminds me of a very primitive bomber man, but without the bombs. You have four baddies trying to home in on you, and you try and squash them with the blocks. Now, I'm not sure if you can actually ever get off that level, because the baddies respawn. So once all the blocks, or whatever they are, disappear, does that mean the level restarts? I don't know. I couldn't get that far. But reading the instructions for the game, there isn't a lot to go by. Apart from the fact I think it is, it is only two screens. So yeah, probably one of the weaker titles I'm going to show you in this set. Now the next one's another early game. Got 1984 on the label, but the old insert looks very similar to Eskimo Eddie. 
of the original Ocean logo. That is called Moon Alert, which is Moon Patrol. So yeah, one of the only arcade clones, if you like. Nothing on the bat, really. Um, this game was done by a couple of gentlemen, one called Ken Farmer and one called John Myers. Both I've never heard of before or since. But I've got to be honest with you, this is quite a slow-paced game. <coughs> it gets difficult relatively quickly, uh, but I did really enjoy it. I spent a lot of time on it, I've got to say. When I say a lot of time, I meant probably about an hour. Um, trying to get a little bit further each time. Now it's one of those games that's difficult because you've got to make some very pixel perfect jumps. Which is not as easy as it sounds. So you're trundling along the moon's surface, jumping over little crevices on the floor, um, shooting UFOs. You've got like a little indicator that flashes to say you're close to a UFO. You take them out whilst trying to navigate the surface of the moon. So yeah, it gets a bit more frantic as time goes on. You literally got to go from A to Z because there is that many different sections in the game. I think I got to section E or D. Yeah, I got stuck. But like I said, the pixel perfect jumping is what will um, derail your efforts, if you like. But yeah, it's a good game. Decent cover art. Uh, a game, again, like I said, only written by those two. By those two? So it's the only game those two made, I think, for Ocean Software. Right, next up we've got quite a fun, entertaining game. Um, with probably the worst beeper chip tune I've ever heard in my life. But luckily, there's an option to turn it off. That is Chinese Juggler. I do like the cover for that, I've got to say. Now using the new Ocean logo. That Ocean logo was done by Bob Wakelin. The other one was done, I think, by Ocean's printer yeah so the people that kind of developed oceans letterheads and all the rest of it so yeah I don't think actually anyone from reading the book knows where the original ocean logo come from but that was their best guess so yeah so Chinese juggler not now I'm not sure if the game originated in China I don't know I don't know where the name Chinese juggler come from but you literally got to juggle or hold up some plates. So you put one plate on a stick, spin it round, it stays up. You've got to do that, I think, up to eight or ten sticks. So you've got to keep them going whilst you go down to the bottom of the screen to pick up a plate to place on a stick. It's good fun. It's frantic. And it gets very frantic very quickly as you progress. But yeah, I've got to say, I thoroughly enjoyed that one. Now, a lot of these games are quite obscure. I went on to eBay just to have a look recently of, of recent sales and stuff. I don't tend to do that once I bought a game. Once I bought a game, I don't really care anymore. But going on there, obviously three of the games are very popular. But the other six are quite are quite yeah quite scarce. You don't see them very often anymore. They're starting to creep up in value as well. Next one is a kind of a mazy game. Again never played this before making this video. A game called Cavlon. This one was done by Christian Urquhart, or Urquhart, and probably supported by Paul Owens. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a mazy game. You've got a door, an outline of a door to the right, and you've got to find the pieces to fill the door. Once you fill the door in, you can escape onto the next level, I think. I've never got to the first level. But you've got to avoid knights, um, who are very devious, and they're quite difficult to kill, especially because if there's two levels of health they got. The purple you got to shoot them twice, the red you shoot them once. The purple ones are sods because they shoot you back. They both shoot you back, but when you shoot, they shoot you. <laughs> yeah, they shoot you twice, don't they? Because they change colour twice. So they're bloody hard. But yeah, it's, it's alright. It's quite a challenging game. My favourite part of the game actually is when you arrive at the castle and a horse puts on its brakes. I thought that was quite funny. Yes. But yeah, the artwork again, Bob Wakelin, looks pretty cool. Not too bad. But yeah, I like that. It's difficult to come across now, though. And the next one is much the same. Another platformer, another obscure one. One that I thought I had in the collection. One I swore I had in the collection. When I came to make this video, I couldn't find it. And 
That is Gilligan's Gold. Let's pick this one up from retrogames.co.uk. Luckily he had it in stock so I can't find it anywhere else. Uh, this game was done by Ronald Rhodes. Again, he's the guy who done Pogo. Very good game this. It's just hard. It takes a little while to get used to it. Here's a platformer. You've got to pick up bags of gold. Take it to the top of the level. Put it in your little um, wheelbarrow. And move on. Um, it took me a while to realise you can drop the bags of gold on the baddies head. When they sort of chase you around. Which they do, they do that relentlessly. Gives you an opportunity to, to escape. But yeah, there's lots of things to try and avoid though. So it's quite a challenging platformer. The more I got into it, the more I liked it. I've got to say. Um, but again, like I said, you don't see it very often. Yeah, I like that. Good game. Decent illustration as well. And then we got the classic. The best multi-sport event game on the Sinclair Spectrum, in my opinion. Um, ten events spread over two days. It can be no other than the man himself. Daily Thompson. Discovered that I do need to upgrade this because it looks horrendous. Uh, luckily, it's probably one of the most common ocean games you can come across. But yeah, it's horrendous. It's the only game that the actual inlay don't seem to fit the box. Not sure if that's normal. But I'm not sure if you can actually see. Yeah, it's like a few millimetres too short. So I wonder if this is an original game. Interesting fact. But yeah, it's, um, like I said, it's, it's really easy to find. It wouldn't cost anyone a pound to buy that game. But I loved it. I mean, the footage you see of me playing the game, doing a high jump, I have a feeling that might be a personal best high jump. When I first played this game back in, what, 85, 86? A couple of years after its release. Um, yeah. Using a keyboard, PC keyboard as well. So yeah, I usually emulate my games, to be fair. Um, the game was designed to run on a rubber key spectrum. And the best way to play the game is by keyboard. I used to play it with a joystick, especially those old, old Atari 2600 joysticks, which used to leave a nasty blister in the palm of your hand. Yeah, it didn't last very long. In fact, many joysticks didn't last very long playing this game, but I loved it. I really do. You can loop it and loop it and loop it until you get to a point where one of the events just becomes that bit too difficult. Now, sometimes that can be the 400 meters. Because by the time you've uh, waggled the joystick for a good, what, 40 seconds, you're knackered. Or it could be the high jump of the pole vault. You get to a certain point, it just it becomes nearly impossible to do. Um, but yeah, I can probably go around four or five times on both days. But yeah, it gets bloody hard. Bloody, yeah. It doesn't get harder, but you get more worn out playing it. Um, that next game is written by the legend uh, Jonathan Smith. Um, very strange one, this one. But the fact he does his own graphics, his own sound, and everything just is amazing. The game is Put Put. Probably the most desirable title that the ones I've shown you in terms of from a collecting standpoint. You don't see it very often. You probably see the Americana version, which is another strange one. It's, it's most ocean games got released under the Hitsquad label. But Put Put didn't. It got re-released -re under Mastertronic's American label. So that was very bizarre. But yeah, you're wandering around the screen. Really not knowing what to do. Because the instructions are a bit vague. It tells you some of the baddies give you energy. And some of the baddies don't. So it takes a little while to discover which ones do and which ones don't. It turns out the insects give you more energy. Yeah. So by the time I worked that out, it, it took multiple times. Then Mrs. Pud Pud turns up every now and then and she sucks the life out of you. <laughs> yeah, she does that and then you die. Um, but yeah, I, I do like that. It's, it's a very different kind of game, I've got to say. Pud Pud in weir Weird World. To be fair, that's some effort though, because this game, in terms of presentation and all the rest of it, is probably head and shoulders of most of the games we've seen so far by Ocean Software. No wonder they took him on as a permanent uh, programmer. Next up, sequel 
to uh, a classic from 1983. I quite like the sequel better than the original game. The artwork, I've got to say, is just as nice. Probably my favourite piece of artwork for 1984. <laughs> There she is. Oh, there he is as well. Look at that. I'm back too. Oh, this game was done by Paul Owens as well. Um, yeah, it's a good game. I like this one. It's more felt more polished than the original game. I think Paul Owens also worked on the original game. And like I said before, the game is in two parts. The Hunchback 2 is just the second half of the Hunchback arcade game. It's in the bell tower. And the footage you see of me playing it, I miraculously got off the first level. It's very difficult. You've got to time it just right. And it took about, I don't know, 15, 20 attempts to get to, or get the chance to get off the first level. Those bloody ropes, you've got to time them just right. And graphically, again, it looks good. That's what I was saying earlier about David Thorpe. Did he do the graphics? I'm pretty sure the C64 version, when you run over the, the battles, they disappear. When you die and respawn, they still disappeared. But on the Spectrum version, you've got to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Let's I imagine that. But yeah, my favourite piece of art, certainly from 1984. And then we've got the last one. Uh, again, another sequel to Ocean Software's first game. Uh, this one, again, I didn't know, was again written by Jonathan Smith. That is Kong Strikes Back. It is basically Donkey Kong, but this time you're at the fairgrounds, you're, ro you're running around a roller coaster, avoiding the little cars, um, picking up hearts. You've got the opportunity, I think, to use one bomb to get rid of one of the cars. I got to level three. I think I misused my bomb and I couldn't get off the bloody level. So yeah, you basically get to the top of the roller coaster, save the girl, move on to the next level, really. It's quite straightforward. I've got to say, again, the illustration is quite nice. quite like it. But yeah, that was it. I wasn't sure who made this game, but some, some of the aspects of it just reminded me of a Jonathan Smith count, uh, game, but then yeah, it was written by him. Yeah, still some games don't tell you who made it, and sometimes you've got to look online to find out who actually did. But yeah, it's all right, it's all right. It's not a great game, it's all right. And then the only variant we got in 1984 is this clam case of Daily Thompson's Decathlon. Uh, I do prefer the clam cases, not many on the Spectrum. I think there's three. Yeah, three on the Spectrum, but more do reside on the Commodore 64. Not quite quite sure why Ocean done that. On the Amstrad, I don't think there is a clam case. But the C64, there's loads of them. Yeah, I do need to upgrade this as well, to be fair. It's a little bit wrinkly. Yeah, great game that. I do prefer the clams. It's a shame all the games weren't released in clam cases. I do think they look fantastic. Yeah, that's it. That's 1984, really. Not a, a very prolific year. I've got to be honest with you, some of those games are quite surprisingly good. Dave Thompson is just one of those games that you just got to play. It's absolutely bloody outstanding. That's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for subscribing. I'll see you again real soon. Take care. And bye for now.